Right now, Satya Rhodes Conway is sworn in today, and she's not wasting any time announcing her first big project as mayor. And a criminal complaint reveals new details on a reported sexual assault at Madison East High School. Plus, the lieutenant governor talks about racial issues in our schools as a Madison School District panel discusses policy at a forum tonight. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 10. Thank you for joining us tonight. The city of Madison now officially has a new mayor. Satya Rhodes Conway was sworn in this afternoon at the city county building downtown. And will perform the duties of mayor. And will perform the duties of mayor. In and for the city of Madison. In and for the city of Madison. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Mayor Rhodes Conway was joined by new members of the Common Council as well, all taking their oaths as well. With nine new alders, almost half of the city's Common Council will be turning over. And Rhodes Conway didn't waste any time on her first day. Immediately after the swearing in ceremony, she held a news conference with Dane County Executive Joe Parisi to announce a joint project. Keely Arthur was there and brings us those details. Well, after lots of back and forth, the county and city have reached a deal on Buckeye Road and Cottage Grove Road reconstruction. Two roads badly in need of some TLC, but didn't get it because the city and county couldn't seem to agree on who was responsible for it. That is until now. Good news for one resident over on Buckeye. Crews past John Hardick's home on Buckeye Road, and you might want to pump the brakes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Everybody's always coming by and looking at my TARDIS. Many Doctor Who fans excitedly stop at the East Side home looking at a replica of the iconic time machine. People come out and they, they want to take pic pictures with it and everything. But even if you're not a fan of the show, you're probably going to have to slow down anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all the time. I mean, all you got to do is look at it. The road is lined with potholes, a problem that's been neglected for years. All they do is come by and put the black gravel in and they pat it with a shovel and then they move on. Hardick says that band-aid to fix a bullet hole mentality doesn't work. Yeah, it's useless. So he's taken to fixing the problem himself, using city-issued sandbags for flooding to fill holes lining what would be a curb. I said, wait a minute. Look at that giant hole there that I have to drive over every day. Why don't I just throw the sandbags in there? Local officials are well aware of the problem and have tried for years to fix Buckeye Road, but the city and county couldn't seem to figure out who was in charge of it. We keep getting mail that says, oh, come for the meeting. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We have the funding. And then you get another piece of mail that says, oh, it's been halted. As of today, it's back on the move. A new administration ushering in a new resolution for the project. We have agreed on how our two units of government are going to take care of this shared asset together. The city is paying for $1.5 million in construction and the county $1.7. Madison will front another $1.9 million for water and sewer improvements. It's good that they're coming together at least to get it done. Hardick just wishes he had a real time machine to hop into and be transported to the project's end result. Now, as for Cottage Grove Road, the county will pay for about $1.4 million in updates, the city $2.6, and $3.4 million will come from the federal government. So lots of things happening under this administration already. Keely, thank you. Investigators say the death of a Cottage Grove man who was found in a field in Marshall over the winter has been ruled accidental due to long exposure to the weather and intoxication. The body of 47-year-old Kurt Meyer was found January 17th near the Evergreen Village Mobile Home Park. Investigators say unless they get any new information, the case is now considered closed. An update to last night's breaking news. Police in Sun Prairie are still searching for three men who they believe shot someone last night near the Prairie Athletic Club. Officers say three masked men were seen leaving the scene shortly after the shooting around 9.15. The 45-year-old victim is still in the hospital with a gunshot wound to the stomach, now said to be in stable condition. Police say they believe the shooting was a targeted incident and continue to investigate. 
to weather now, a chance for some severe weather tomorrow. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canolti has our first alert forecast. Gary? Charlotte, we'll have to keep an eye on things. A lot of it will depend on how warm we get, whether we get a little sunshine, and where a warm front eventually ends up. But as we start off by taking a look at an alert day that we have in the forecast for tomorrow, we do have one in for the possibility for an isolated strong to severe thunderstorm. Gusty winds, hail, perhaps some heavy downpour is the main threats there. Now on Doppler track, some showers already starting to show up in western Minnesota and um, the eastern portion of North Dakota. This is actually the northern portion of a large warm air mass to our south and west, which is heading in our direction. And because of that, the Storm Prediction Center does have a, mod or a marginal risk of severe thunderstorms into southern Wisconsin for tomorrow with a slight risk uh, along and south of I-80 in eastern Iowa and western Illinois. Low temperatures this morning started out mild. We were at 46 for the overnight low temperature in Madison. High temperatures today climbed into the middle 60s. A few places hit the 70 degree mark, including Janesville, Mineral Point, and Boscobel. And current temperatures have cooled down into the upper 30s to around 40 near Lake Michigan, around 50 in Madison, and still close to 60 to the southwest over toward Prairie du Chien and Dubuque, Iowa. So by tomorrow morning, look for temperatures to be in the upper 40s to around 50. There'll be some scattered showers, maybe a thunderstorm, and then some scattered showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. It will be mild, though, with a high temperature of 63. That's your news for now. First alert forecast. All right, Gary, thank you. A criminal complaint is released today related to the alleged sexual assault that happened at Madison East High School. According to that complaint, the victim claims one of the two 15-year-old students charged in the case took her backpack to get her into the third floor bathroom. This was last Wednesday, and that's where the assault allegedly happened. Surveillance video confirms both boys were in the bathroom during the time that the girl reported the sexual assault. Since the controversy at Whitehorse Middle School this year, where an 11-year-old African-American student says she was assaulted, race equity in schools has been on the forefront of the community's mind. The administrator is not facing any charges, but it still brings up the discussion. Amy Reed shows us how a group tonight made up of activists, educators, a lawyer, and a doctor is trying to start the conversation. Audience, do you have any questions? This group is hoping to start a conversation. The current program is not actually working for people who have um, particular needs. A conversation about race, about schools, and about how we all see each other. What is considered normative behavior, as Brandy said, meaning what's considered normal or healthy conflict resolution? Right, if I'm upset and I express my being upset by being verbal, by being responsive in the moment, by being direct in my communication, that scene is, can, is often seen by white mainstream culture as abnormal and aggressive. In a state continually ranked as one of the worst for racial equality, we wanted to bring the conversation even further, right to the lieutenant governor. With that lack of cultural understanding, with that lack of uh, knowing how to respond to certain instances, you see the worst case scenarios often play out. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's one of many ways that it, it, it plays out uh, all across the state. So we have to do a much better job. He agrees it starts with a conversation, but then it goes to the issues that cause students of color to face barriers at school. He says things like hunger, crime, or not having access to preventative health care. When we work to address those issues first, you will see uh, education transform itself because students are then prepared to learn. Teachers are then in an environment, educators are then in an environment, administrators have fewer concerns uh, to address when students are able uh, to be in a place uh, and they are starting at square one, where square one means the same thing for each student. But that starts places like this one. The process is what it is. It's not going to change until we come together and become unified in partnership to try to look at the process to kind of dismantle some of those layers. There's a lot more conversation to be had here, so we'll put our full interview with Mandela Barnes on our website, channel3000.com. Amy, thank you. Prosecutors say the teenager accused of killing his grandparents in northeastern Wisconsin typed out plans for the shootings. 17-year-old Alexander Krauss was charged today with two counts of first-degree intentional homicide for the deaths of Dennis and Letha Krauss on Sunday at their home in Grand Chute. The complaint says the plans for the killings were found in a backpack along with a book about an executioner. However, a motive is still unclear. Police said the suspect told investigators he also was planning to cause harm at Nina High School, where he was a student. The man accused of throwing a child off a Mall of America balcony last week also made his first appearance in court today. Emmanuel Aranda was charged with attempted murder, and his bond is set at $2 million. They say Aranda went to the Mall of America to kill someone that day. 
criminal complaint says the boy's mother told investigators that Aranda came close to them outside the Rainforest Cafe, picked up the child and threw him over the balcony. The five-year-old is now fighting for his life with head trauma and broken arms and legs. Tonight, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris is a battered shell of its former self, but it is still standing and funds are already being raised to rebuild. Flames destroyed most of the 800-plus-year-old landmark's roof, including its 300-foot spire. The world got its first look inside today. Piles of charred timber can be seen as the light pours in through the gaping hole above. French President Emmanuel Macron made a nationally televised address to discuss the disaster, praising the efforts of first responders and expressed hope that the cathedral would soon be restored. And two French billionaire rivals are seeing who can give the most money to rebuild it. Francois Pinot announced he and his company would donate 100 million euros, or about $113 million, to help finance the cathedral's restoration. And then hours later, Bernard Arnault doubled the donation of his rival, equivalent to $226 million. This donation competition, it's not much of a surprise in France. The rivalry of the two tycoons goes back decades. Still ahead tonight, the troubled Boeing 737 MAX, one step closer now to getting back in the air. And President Donald Trump is planning to make a campaign trip to the Badger State this week. We'll have details about his rally next. President Trump issued the second veto of his presidency just hours ago. That veto stops a congressional resolution that would have ended U.S. involvement in the Saudi-led war in Yemen. Uh, the president says the Yemen War Powers Resolution is a, quote, unnecessary, dangerous attempt to weaken his constitutional authorities. Supporters of the resolution argue the U.S. shouldn't be involved in the war without permission from Congress, while opponents argue the U.S. doesn't have boots on the ground and is offering non-combat technical assistance to an ally in Saudi Arabia. President Trump also plans to visit Wisconsin. This will be at the end of the month, holding a rally April 27th. It'll be in Green Bay at the Resch Center. Seven o'clock start in the evening for that, and people can register for up to two tickets, and those tickets 
will be offered on a first come first serve basis. President Trump now has a primary challenger and he's already hitting the campaign trail. Former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld spoke to a crowd in New Hampshire today just one day after launching a primary challenge to Trump. Weld was a 2016 vice presidential candidate on the libertarian ticket with Gary Johnson. The Justice Department is planning to release a redacted version of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report Thursday morning. Attorney General William Barr will release the 400-page report, but things like grand jury testimony, classified information, and material related to ongoing investigations will not be made public. President Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, says he plans to release a rebuttal to the report to minimize any politically damaging information it might have. Actress Felicity Huffman could face between four and ten months in jail for her role in that college admission scandal. A law enforcement source says Huffman was one of the 13 parents who agreed to plead guilty last week to a charge of conspiracy to commit fraud. A total of 33 parents, including the Desperate Housewives star, have been accused of using their wealth to give their children into colleges. Huffman due back in court May 21st for sentencing. Boeing 737 MAX, one step closer now to flying again. The Federal Aviation Administration panel released a draft report today saying Boeing has made changes to the model's stabilization system that are operationally suitable. The panel says Boeing can now start planning to train pilots on how the system works. The U.S. grounded all of the 737 MAX airplanes after the Ethiopian Airlines crash back in March. If you are looking for something to do this Saturday, you might want to visit a U.S. National Park. The National Park Service is kicking off National Park Week by waiving all entrance fees on Saturday, which means admission to more than 400 National Park Service sites are free to everyone. But the entrance fee doesn't cover amenity or user fees like camping, transportation, or special tours. This Thursday is a day many people have been waiting for. The terrace chairs at the Memorial Union will be put out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, officially kicking off the 2019 Terrace season. In what has become a community event, if you want to help put those out, people can line up at the North Park Street entrance starting at 3 p.m. It might be cooler on Thursday, Gary says, but uh, first we got through some possibility of uh, severe weather tomorrow, Gary. I think actually Friday will probably be the better day for the chairs uh, simply because we'll have more sunshine. But you're right, we have the possibility for some severe weather tomorrow. Uh, a lot of it will depend on temperatures and where a warm front eventually ends up. Now today we had high temperatures in the mid-60s here in Madison, but notice to the south and west, temperatures did hit the lower 70s in a few spots. Janesville, 72, Mineral Point 72, Boscobel at 71 degrees, whereas closer to Lake Michigan, a lake breeze there kept temperatures in the upper 50s, and then those temperatures actually dropped off quite a bit during the uh, afternoon hours. Now, as we take a look at Doppler track, things are pretty quiet across southern Wisconsin. To the west, a few light showers starting to develop in North Dakota and western Minnesota, but eventually we'll see more showers and some thunderstorms develop to the south and west, and then those will move in by late tomorrow night and off and on through the day tomorrow. Storm Prediction Center has a marginal risk of severe thunder storms into southern Wisconsin with a slight risk, the higher risk, farther south down toward I-80 in eastern Iowa and for parts of uh, west central Illinois. Rainfall amounts, according to the latest computer model forecast, have come down quite a bit. It keeps the heavier rains of one to two inches in the northern half of Wisconsin, but only brings a few one hundredths of an inch of rain here. And the reason for that is the very latest computer models have actually been bringing that warm front a little further to the north. So while that may le lessen the heavy rain potential, that may actually increase the severe weather potential. And here's why. If you take a look at future track right now uh, the easterly winds will uh, basically uh, start us off cool but as those southerly winds and the warm front gets about to uh, lacrosse to maybe Wisconsin Dells to uh, Lake Geneva line temperatures south of the front will be in the upper 60s to lower 70s notice Milwaukee that easterly wind off the lake only 46 there 47 in Green Bay and 44 in Marshfield so there'll be a big temperature contrast the uh, widespread thunderstorms will be north of the warm front but the severe weather potential will be highest along and south of the warm front. Then eventually a cold front comes through and this is by uh, midnight uh, tomorrow night. Notice the front about to Milwaukee. The wind shift around to the west and temperatures stay in the 40s to around 50 degrees on Thursday behind the front with the shower chances gradually coming to an end. If we take a look at the instability, this begins at noon tomorrow. You can see the highest instability arrives early tomorrow evening, mainly again south of that warm front over southwestern Wisconsin. It's not a great amount of instability, but it could be enough to trigger an isolated severe thunderstorm or two and then that starts to wane by early 
early on Thursday morning. So there is an alert day in the forecast for uh, tomorrow for an isolated strong to severe thunderstorm with some gusty winds, hail and heavy rains the main threat. Right now pretty quiet out there. The live view from the Edgewater Sky Camp. Skies are mostly cloudy. It's a thin overcast though. High today 66, the low 46. Right now our temperatures at 50 degrees with an east northeasterly wind at 8 miles per hour and skies are partly cloudy. Our forecast for tonight calls for skies to be mostly cloudy. We'll see a chance for a shower and thunderstorm by morning. Low temperature dropping off to 47 degrees. Tomorrow we'll see that wind shift from the east to the south and that'll get our high temperature up to 63. We'll see some scattered showers and thunderstorms, but areas well north of Madison could stay in the 40s and down toward the Illinois state line could be around 70. And again, you see this on future track. The threat for a shower and thunderstorm late tonight through the day tomorrow. Some thunderstorms popping up during the afternoon into tomorrow evening and then the cooler air starts to wrap around so that on Thursday we look for high temperatures only in the lower 50s with the shower chances gradually coming to an end. Again, the heavier rain threat might be a little farther to the north, but we'll still see some showers and thunderstorms elsewhere. As we look at the 7 to 10 day forecast, notice those temperatures going back up for the uh, Easter weekend. 70 for a high on Easter Sunday with just a slight chance of a shower or thunderstorm and temperatures mainly in the 60s for much of next week. Low to mid 60s, so pretty comfortable there. All right, not bad. Thank no, you. You're welcome. Well, graduation, that's not too far off. And J.J. Watt will be speaking at the UW commencement this year, but sounds like he's not quite ready for that speech yet. We'll have a story coming up at sports.
The Brewers play starting pitcher Freddie Peralta on the injured list with a strained SC joint. That's what connects the collarbone to the sternum. Brewers host the Cardinals tonight, and they just own St. Louis. What a night for pitcher Brandon Woodruff. Not only is he the winning pitcher, he also drives in two with a double. Brandon Woodruff is hitting 714 so far this season, five out of seven. And guess what? Christian Yelich in another homer. A three-run shot in the fifth. Yelich has eight homers in six games against the Cardinals this season. Final score, Brewers 8, Cardinals 4. An afternoon game at 1240 tomorrow at Miller Park. Cubs, by the way, won in Miami 4-0. Badger football announced the date of its season opener in 2026. The Western Michigan Broncos will be at Camp Randall Saturday, September 5th, 2026. That's over seven years from now. Everyone wants to know about quarterback Graham Mertz as an early enrollee and figures to push for the starting position this fall. Now, we're very early in spring practice, but quarterback's coach John Budmeyer, also a former Wisconsin QB, says Mertz has stayed very grounded. What he does a great job of is being in the moment, and I think that helps him not look too far ahead, not look at what the future holds, but truly just dive into it. And he's done that since day one here. He did a great job. There was a lot of um, different obstacles he worked through in the recruiting process to get here, and so he's very mature, and he's allowed himself the opportunity to have success because he's how, of how he's kept himself in the moment. That WIA football realignment plan was unanimously approved by the Board of Control today, and the changes will begin in the 2020 football season. Janesville Craig and Parker will both move to the, from the Big 8 to the Badger Conference in 2020, and a lot of other conference dominoes will be falling too. Russell Wilson set a deadline for getting a new contract from the Seattle Seahawks, and he beat that deadline by a half hour early this morning. Wilson gets a new four-year, $140 million deal with a $65 million signing bonus. He's now the highest paid player ever in the NFL. Wilson is just ahead of Aaron Rodgers' new deal with the Packers. Atlanta's Matt Ryan, the only other NFL player to average $30 million a season. And you know who's not on that list? Tom Brady. He'll make $14 million a season. Another former Badger, J.J. Watt, is coming to Madison to be the keynote speaker at UW commencement at Camp Randall Stadium May 11th. Watt was asked to send along his speech so they could put it in the teleprompter. But Watt said he hadn't planned anything. He was just going to wing it. He said, you're not going to write a speech. What are you going to talk about? I said, I don't know. I'm just going to go up there and talk. Yeah, I mean, I, that was my full plan. I did not know that, like, you had to write it all out. I'm dead. I didn't know. There, he was like, they have a teleprompter for you. What do you want on it? I said, no, I don't, nothing, I don't need it. Just give me a black screen and tell me when to stop talking. And I was, that was literally my plan, but I found out you have to write some stuff down. So I have about a month to figure it out. Watt says he does have a message to tell, but he adds, let's be honest, the graduates just want the speaker to give a cool message for about five minutes, then get off the stage so they can go home and drink beer. Sounds about right. And we'll be right back.
All right, Gary, we go. Final check of the forecast. Things pretty quiet out there right now. Uh, just some showers trying to develop up in Minnesota and North Dakota, but there is a marginal risk of severe thunderstorms through much of southern Wisconsin tomorrow afternoon into tomorrow night. Temperature is pretty mild right now, but notice the difference. 37 in Manitowoc, 60 in Prairie du Chien. So a pretty good temperature contrast. That's what might fuel the thunderstorms tomorrow. Uh, look for uh, cooler weather on Thursday. The showers will come to an end Friday morning, and then nice weather for the Easter weekend. Just a slight chance of a thunderstorm on Easter Sunday. And temperatures between 60 and 65 next week. All right, Gary, thanks. Thanks for joining us for News 3 Now at 10. Do something good, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.